Hey everybody, welcome to note video number three in unit two. In this note video, we're going to talk about insulators, conductors, and how heat moves around through conduction, convection, and radiation. So there are three ways that heat energy is transferred. Three ways that thermal energy gets moved from one material to another through what we call heat. And these are conduction, convection, and radiation. And you are going to need to know the difference between the three. The first is conduction. And this is when you literally have particles of one material touching another material. They run into it. And when they run into it, they transfer some of their speed to the material on the other one. You can picture kind of like on a pool table. You have a bunch of balls sit sitting around, maybe even moving around slowly, and if you roll one ball really fast into them, it's gonna transfer some of its speed into the other balls, and that is how conduction works. It's that speed transfer that is heat. So, um, conduction is the only way that you can transfer heat without actually moving the materials. All you need to do is have them touch. And as it works out, you get fast-moving particles that run into slow-moving particles and speed them up. Convection has to do with currents. So convection works pretty closely with density. Um, so as particles heat up, they're moving faster. And if it's a gas or even if it's a liquid, this can cause the material to get bigger, also with a solid. Um, can cause the material to get bigger, but if it's a gas or a liquid, something that can flow, then you have a change in density. And when you have a change in density, it's going to rise. And then as it rises and cools, the material will, will come back together again, its volume will decrease again in size, and then its density will drop back down, and then, and then the material will fall. So this is a picture of a pot on a stove, and in the middle you see the heat, so the heat is creating um, a, a section of water here with lower density because it's warmer, and that is going to then rise. Hot things rise. Hot air, hot liquid rises. And then it's, as it cools, the continuing warm rise is going to push it off to the sides, and it's going to fall back down, and then it's going to heat up again and go back up, and this is called a convection current. So it happens in water. It also happens in air. So here are some pictures of some convection currents, currents that would happen, um, we'll say like out over the desert or something like that. Maybe a spot in the ground has a material that has a specific heat that allows it to get warmer quicker. Well, that's going to cause the air above it to get warm and rise, and birds will make use of this. These updrafts, they call them thermals, if you're talking to people who like hang glide or parachute, you can ride these. There's enough upwind going up that it'll actually lift you up in the air. And the birds can then just glide on these. And then when they want to dive down, they'll go into the part of the air that's going down, and that'll help them get some speed. So if you ever look at things like vultures in the desert, how they're going around in circles, they're riding these thermal currents. Um, you know, a little bit like surfing. They're just catching the wind as it's coming up and just kind of cruising around, and you can literally spiral up into the air with them and go higher and higher and higher. Just a little biology fun fact in case you didn't know. This is a vulture. Um, it's evolved to not have any feathers on its head, so it can stick its face right into a carcass and eat without getting all funky on its feathers. Um, but even more importantly, the vulture is the only bird that can smell uh, one of the only birds that can smell. It's a very, very rare feature with birds. Uh, it works well for the vulture because the vulture can actually then smell something dead from pretty far away and then go and find it. Most other birds hunt by sight. They have really good eyes. The vulture has a really good olfactory sense. Radiation is the third way that heat moves around. And this is heat movement through electromagnetic waves, like infrared. It's the only way that you can move heat, uh, or that you can move thermal energy in the form of heat, that doesn't require matter. Since electromagnetic waves are a form of energy, they can travel through the emptiness of space. And this is how heat energy, this is how thermal energy gets from the sun to earth. 
because there's no air particles over like in space to like speed up and slam into each other and, and pass that speed along. So it has to happen through pure energy like infrared light. And you can see um, radiation in the form of infrared light with special lenses on cameras and you can actually see things that are warmer and cooler. So a situation like this, we have all the different kinds of heat transfer going on. We have radiation coming off of the fire. Uh, you can feel that from far away with your hands. If you actually then like touch the fire to the pan or whatever, you can get uh, the heat transfer going on there. Then it goes from the pan through conduction into the water, and then the water gets convection currents going on. There's also convection going on in the air around here. Um, if you put your hand above the fire, it feels much warmer than if you put it off to the side. Uh, you get conduction from the pan going up into the handle. You want the handle to be made out of a metal with, with a, uh, a different specific heat so it doesn't get too hot, preferably a really high specific heat. So here we have a quick question. Um, so how do the thermos work? Um, so thermoses typically have a couple of different layers. Uh, we have the outer case. We have the inner case where you're going to put your liquid, whether you want to keep it hot or cold, because thermoses do both. You have your cap, and then you have a space in between the outer and the inner layer. So use this information to try to explain how a thermos keeps liquids hot or cold, and we'll address this in class. So there's a couple different kinds of materials out there, and they can be ranked by how well or how efficiently they conduct thermal energy, how efficiently they can transfer thermal energy from one place to another through heat. If a material is very good at this, it is called a conductor. Metals make great conductors. Uh, metals also make great conductors of electricity, which means they can move um, electrical energy from one place to another. But we're talking about thermal energy here. The opposite would be an insulator, and that's something that doesn't transfer heat energy very well. Uh, air is a really good insulator for the reasons that I explained in the last note video. Uh, in order for you to move heat from one place to another, uh, you, you need those air particles to like slam into each other. Well, air has, uh, you know, the particles are kind of spaced out a little bit, so the chance of them running into each other, it's, it's very low, so you have the like lower efficiency. Whereas something that's a solid, um, all the particles are touching all the time, so it's easy to move. Like a slight vibration will ch like chain reaction down, down the line. So they're usually really good at heat transfer. Um, here, example of this, this wire, we have the insulator of the copper, and we have, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we have the conductor of the copper and the insulator of the rubber. Um, so this is, picture is probably for more electrical work, but uh, the same principle applies. If you were to heat the wire up on one end, and grab the wire on this end, it would feel hotter before the rubber would insulate, before the rubber would get hot, because it's an insulator. This is the picture of wood that I mentioned in the last uh, note video. I was one note video off. So this is a microscopic electron microscope picture of wood. So here are the wood cells, the plant cells of the wood. And these squares are what's left over after the plant dies. These are the cell walls made of cellulose, which the plant makes by actually stringing together a bunch of glucose molecules. And if you string it together in one way, you make starch, which the plant can use for food. String it together in a different way, you make cellulose, which you can't use for food, but makes a great support. So after the plant dies, or at least when these parts of the, the plant die, the, the inner part of the wood, uh, the plant uses this for structure. Well, when you cut the tree down and you let it all die, um, these spots here, which normally would have be filled with cytoplasm and the nucleus and ribosomes and mitochondria and chloroplasts, if it was a leaf, I suppose, uh, and everything else that you learned about in seventh grade, when all of that stuff disappears, you're left with just this hollow cavity that's filled with air. So wood makes a really good thermal insulator because if I heat up this side, in order for the the thermal energy, the heat, to get from one side of the wood to the other, it has to pass through a bunch of pockets of air. This is why when you have a log in a fire, one side of the log can be on fire, and you can reach down and grab the other side of the log if it's sticking out of the fire and like reposition it. Like the one side of the wood can be totally cool while the other side's actually burning. Um, it does not 
transfer thermal energy very well along its core. The same principle works with the insulation in your house, like I described in the last note video. Um, but it's these air pockets that allow for this to happen. So if you compress all those air pockets, or if you have a really dense piece of wood, it will transfer uh, heat better. And that takes us to the third booby trap. So you might want to put a line in your notes so you know that this is the section that you need to study. See you in class.